If I look at New Zealand art at the moment, I, s I see a strong Pacific theme, but then that Pacific theme is mixed in with, you know, colonial um, Western culture, and it's also mixed in with Asian and, you know, Indian, Chinese, um, and, and even and African. It's, it's all a melting pot here. Summer has just started in Aotearoa. I've swapped freezing France for the sun after 37 hours in a plane, one layover, and 12 hours lost to the greatest time difference possible in order to meet the Kiwis. Not the well-known fruit of home, but rather the people of New Zealand. I'm going to try to discover, by traveling the roads of this little island, what the artists of this country have to show us and tell us. Photographers, painters, sculptors, and musicians are letting me capture their voices while, like me, they ponder their artistic identities. I am Megan Jeliza. Um, I'm originally from Manila, Philippines. I've been living here for more than six years now, and um, I'm an Auckland-based um, pop surreal painter. <laughs> Marshall. I originally come from um, Thundersley, which is in Essex, which is near London in England, but I've been based out of um, Auckland, New Zealand now for 18 years. Uh, my name is Flip Crater. I'm a New Zealand singer-songwriter and I play guitar, acoustic guitar, and sort of make indie folk music. My name is uh, Noel Rauri Woods. Uh, my tribes are Te Atiawa, Ngāti Pro, and I pretty much grew up here in Waifetu, Pukitapu Grove. The quest for an artistic identity can be explained by the fact that today New Zealand's heritage is made up of a multitude of influences, from the 900-year-old Maori culture to that of newer European and Asian immigrants. We're finding out what, what Maori heritage means to all of us, even if we don't have a Maori bloodline, and then we're finding out what um, people from other parts of the world who are recently coming here as immigrants, how do they integrate into our lives and our worldviews? It all comes through art. I mean, art is just an expression of who we are culturally. When you compare our European history, not necessarily the Māori history, but the European history with Europe, you know, 200 years, is, it's just like that. In a way, I suppose it's a good thing, you know, that other ethnic groups um, come to New Zealand and, you know, we're, we're always open to sharing that Māori experience with them. But in the way, um, you know, as the population increases, and maybe the Māori population decreases, um, hopefully we don't get you know, shoved to the corner and be forgotten about and, and be spread out to the general community. Sophia Minson is a New Zealand painter of Maori descent. From the very beginning of her career, she has portrayed her ancestors in her paintings, allowing everyone to see the authenticity and importance of the place of such a culture. I grew up in Auckland, but I've also lived with my family overseas in Samoa and Sri Lanka when I was in my early teenage years. 
when I returned to New Zealand, age 14, and I started painting about my experiences and about many different cultures and ways of life. Um, so I've done Sri Lankan, big Sri Lankan portraits and African people, and, um, and that then led on to painting Māori people and painting my own family and my own heritage. The strongest identity here is Māori culture because they were here first and, um, and there is that special relationship with the land that goes for thousands of years. Noel Woods and his tribe, Tayatiawa, make up a major hapu group in the Wellington region. Each week, this Maori tribe puts the waka in the water to trace the same paths as their Polynesian ancestors. To my great surprise, they offer me this fabulous haka war cry while standing in the water, which leaves me speechless. Maori history fascinates me. This fighting people, their spirit captured in their haka war cry, is still fighting. Since 1840, when the Treaty of Watangi was signed between the British Crown and 40 Maori chiefs, the country has exemplified the image of successful unification. But believing that everything has been perfect ever since would be naive of me. The way Maori were treated uh, during you know, the colonization period, um, the way we were just moved around, and particularly here in Waifetu, you know, we used to live in Wellington City, then we got kicked out of our own land so they could build a city moved out here to the Hutt Valley, just on the river beat out there, and then once again moved again to where we are now, here in Waifatu. That history of, politi of politics, of colonisation, has, um, has been quite important, quite an important discussion point in our art making. Following the Watangi Treaty signing, one of the Maori chiefs said, the shadow of the land goes to the queen, but the substance remains. A year later, he rectified his words, saying that it was the opposite that had occurred. Andrea Duchatinier explains that Maori art, just like the articles of the treaty, has also been misappropriated by certain Pakeha. Maori culture is absolutely unique in the world, absolutely unique. Um, and Europeans um, have borrowed that culture to promote themselves. So th there are these political anxieties that exist. During the um, 1950s, there were, was um, 
what was called the Māori Renaissance in art making, and led by um, a lot of uh, influence very heavily by European artists like Gordon Walters, who later were accused of appropriating Māori imagery. Later, the 1970s and 1980s, there was a critique of those borrowings of Māori and Pacific Island motifs um, as a type of ownership of a culture, using Māori imagery as a way of um, asserting power in some ways. And that concept of appropriation and appropriating images um, from Māori culture was a real no-no. It was um, considered to be very, very bad form and a, a political problem. The relationship between the indigenous people, I'm, I'm Māori myself, um, and the, um, you know, if you like, colonisers has caused issues that, uh, you know, coming down through the generations, there's poverty and drug abuse and all of those things that indigenous people all over the world have to contend with. We are from this land, this is our land, and uh, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed in partnership with the Crown, uh, with the, the knowledge of the protection of our Māori culture, which they haven't done, so there's still that fight there. Um, and it will remain forever, I think. You know, it's still not getting better. Things aren't that great at the moment. We will keep fighting, I think. Using music, hopefully, to, to help us with that fight. The band, last band, Te, te Rō Pūwhaka Mutunga Mo Te Rangi Nei. All the way from Waifu 2, ladies and gentlemen, I need you fellas to give it up big time. Grove Roots in the house! <laughs> lucky to be in Wellington, the country's capital, to celebrate the 172nd anniversary of the treaty signing. Noel Woods and his group Groove Roots are giving a concert today, and he explains how their reggae music has become so important to the core of the Maori culture. The reggae is very popular among the Maori culture. Reggae music was huge, especially for around the 70s and 80s where yeah, the times were tough for Māori, and they used reggae music to, to keep on track, um, and used reggae music to uh, you know, get their message out. And in fact, Wellington played a, a huge part in reggae music in New Zealand. Uh, one of the first reggae bands was created here in Wellington, in the Porirua area. Uh, bands like Sticks and Shanty, Dread, Beat and Blood, and all of their music was Kopapa Māori, you know, talking about how the government and the Crown are always pulling us down. Uh, so reggae and the Māori culture work really well together in regards to the fight that the Māori culture had at that time, in particular around the 70s and the 80s. For this occasion, the city is organizing a series of artistic and cultural encounters. There are concerts and performances, tours of the incredible Te Papa Museum, and even a historical show. All of this to honor the unification of two peoples. I'm leaving behind the youth, charm, and ambiance of Wellington and going back on the road to get back to my departure point, Auckland, which means traveling 400 miles, a nine-hour drive. I'm meeting Flip Grader, a New Zealand singer and guitarist who also has an international following. 
Her appearance on the music scene symbolizes the success of ethnic diversity, an advantage that few countries can claim today. Um, yeah, I, apparently Auckland is like one of the most culturally diverse cities in the world. I heard something about that, that, that Auckland has um, a, an insane amount of different cultures represented, which is so fantastic. With any art, you can't help but be influenced by your environment. I think, you know, regardless of whether it's conscious or subconscious, you're, everything that you experience in your life um, and in your environment is going to come through the art that you produce. That's what creation is, kind of funneling everything around you through, out through yourself in, in some form or another. My family went to church, so we used to sing in the church. But apart from that, my first experience of singing was always through this Māori culture group, a kapahaka group that I was in, involved in through my school. So all of my, all of the first songs really that I learned were um, waiata, or Māori songs. So yeah, I guess it's a big part of growing up in New Zealand is that, that's, that you, you are um, experiencing um, more than, like, several cultures, really. Just as I predicted Right where I'm along I'm already gone I am gone None of this counts For nothing The following Kiwis describe what New Zealand's artistic scene has to offer, with both its advantages and drawbacks. It is doable to base yourself in a smaller in a smaller town, and then submit your work in a big city. But I think it's just not the same. Like you wouldn't get, you know, those same opportunities if you were living in a big city. For example, you can just walk around, and then suddenly you meet someone who happened to be doing an art show and, you know, you were showing your work maybe at a cafe and, you know, you wouldn't have that opportunity if you were living in a small town. The percentage of artists who can be successful, I don't know, 5%, maybe less. I mean, a lot of people want to be an artist. And then in your country, our market, our pool is so small and even smaller amount of people can actually achieve success from that. So for me, I don't want to be rich. I want to have enough money to do this music and to help it grow for the rest of my life. It's... It's not greed, it's just wanting that's to all. do our chosen profession for a job. Yeah. If we went to medical school for seven years and then leave, we're guaranteed to be a doctor, that's that. Well, I've been doing music since I was five. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and and there's no guarantee, unless you want to become a music teacher, I mean, these are options, but there's no set in stone way to do step by step by step and then guarantee to achieve uh, popular music success. There's a lot of brilliant people um, boiling away in their little corners, creating amazing things um, that are innovative. I think that's like a very, New Zealand thing. You can't just have one gallery, you need an agent, 
who will then take you to many different galleries and find you many different opportunities all over the world. Um, I haven't got an agent like that, so I have to be my own agent. In the UK now, the biggest export um, of the UK is music, has been for about four years. Uh, I think if you look at it in New Zealand, obviously our biggest export here is dairy. So, um, you know, there's dairy, there's fisheries, there's everything else, and then music is, is, I don't know how long down the list, but it's, you know, probably 100 and something. In addition to a precarious artistic industry, the cost of living is rather high. And in order for artists to be able to express themselves without spending a lot, some, like Elliot Collins, rely on making deals. I find him in the space he shares with about 30 other artists. Each has their own space and is trying to make a name for themselves on the New Zealand scene. He recounts his beginnings and how he came to find his artistic path. The art, which is just for like a hobby, a weekend thing, and not a job, not a profession. I think that's sometimes, sometimes dangerous because that becomes, um, people get stuck in that. I think even to my parents, I have to sort of, pro I think last year my mum said, oh, I'm quite glad you're an artist, but that's taken you know, 27 years to convince her that this is what I want to do. I think I started being a pretty purist painter. I didn't I sort of, I, I thought that painting was strict images and landscapes and portraits and fruit. Like just really um, quite straight and strict. And as I got, as, it was probably art school, because as soon as art school arrived, I just, your mind just gets exploded with artists and input. And, Like in many countries, the American presence and influence can be felt, and the language that the two countries share does not aid local creation, but rather greatly favors a preponderance of American programming. American pop culture is pretty much directly dictating to New Zealand a lot of the time. The mainstream media and the mainstream TV and radio and, and everything is seems to be quite strongly led by American trends and American culture. But yeah, that's, that's the general sort of thing that we notice about New Zealand as far as being influenced by overseas. It's a real strong American presence. The New Zealand market definitely consumes more music than what it produces. Um, at present, I think we're around 20, 25% of um, Kiwi music is actually played on the radio stations here. So predominantly three quarters of the music is still coming from overseas mainly from, from the UK and the US, as I've said before. To be honest, the whole world's influenced by America, yeah. by Europe, you know, we, and maybe even Asia, when we, we eat you know, fast food from America, uh, we buy a lot of products from overseas. Um, so in a way, I suppose, you know, we're living American, so we're heavily influenced by, by that. Uh, which shows on the radio, you know, we've got a lot of American music, and, which is disappointing, really. New Zealand music has a lot of respect around the world, and it is evolving. I mean, we've got enough talent here in Aotearoa uh, to play only our music uh, on the radio, you know. We, we don't really need uh, international influences. Uh, but once again, you know, mainstream, the market demands, you know, American music, European music. Uh, so hopefully one day there'll be so much New Zealand music that that's all you will hear on the radio. Good morning. Uh, that was Spawn Breezy with I'm In Love and of course he's coming to Porirua City on the 22nd of March hitting Hill 16 uh, alongside Chan Chambers, uh, also Vintage and local band Grove Roots in support. Uh, you can get your tickets from ticketmaster.co.nz and for more information check out reggaebynature.com. I've been working here for two years now at the Māori radio station running the breakfast show and I mean Māori radio stations were created to promote the Māori language so each Māori radio station have to play eight hours of Māori music and Māori language and Māori content. Uh, the rest of the hours can be in English if you choose to, like we do. We, we broadcast in English as well. Um, so it's great with regards to uh, promoting our language. 
Uh, and the point of difference between us and the, and the commercial radio uh, is huge. You know, I mean, the opportunity for local artists to, to come in. Uh, and I suppose if I was offered an opportunity to work in mainstream commercial radio, um, I'd have to think pretty hard. Since I've been here in the last 20 years, it, um, the music industry has seen ups and downs uh, and I think we're definitely in a down part at the moment like there's live venues that are closing down um, the, the radio stations there used to be a lot more radio stations that, that had a lot more program directors now because of the recession they've all amalgamated so so now um, there's a specific radio station over here that used to have 30 odd program directors w within their radio station they now have one who programs the entire country so, so that's a lot of opportunities missed that, that have changed over time Megan Jeliza tells me how, rather than adopting the anti-American trend, she has managed to take advantage of it and has found herself as an artist. Today she knows what kind of artist she is and has the necessary objectivity to proudly express her Filipino roots and her American influences, as well as the fact that she is a real New Zealand artist. Because it's such a small country, um, there is not a lot of opportunities for commercialization. So unlike in other countries where in, say an artist can look at a market and say, oh, I want to make this so that I can sell millions of this, there's not like that here. That's a bad thing and a good thing at the same time, because the great thing about it is artists become really sincere about their work. It's like, well, I can't sell out because there's no one to sell out to, so might as well do something amazing. And you'd see that in music, you'd see that in art. And also being a small um, country, it's so, and people know each other, everyone knows each other. It's so easy to call someone out if they're bullshitting. It's like, you're bullshitting, like, you know? So it's easy to kind of do that. So people tend to be sincere. I actually wanted to be a writer. So I'm really influenced by literature and I like whimsical things. I like fairy tale. I like um, skulls and, you know, candy and unicorns. Around 2003, I discovered pop surrealism, which is an art movement from America. And these artists from LA, they were doing paintings that have stories. And they mixed a lot of, you know, different um, imagery um, and they combined them together and that's how they tell their story. And I, when I first saw that, I was like, wow, that's, that's so cool and that's really me. Going abroad is common for New Zealanders. It offers a viable alternative to artists seeking an audience or a larger arena. For quite a while, um, there are bands that have made it in, in New Zealand and then moved overseas because the opportunities in New Zealand weren't great enough for the band to grow to, the, to, to their potential. So they have always felt that to, to be super huge, you have to leave New Zealand. You know, New Zealand only has the population of one city, one international city. It's not enough people. Um, especially if your if your artwork is is a bit more niche, so that's what I uh, that's what I mean about trying to find pockets of audiences all over the world so that my niche markets can add up to a full audience. If you do anything other than commercial music, it's a much harder way to make money. So um, you have to leave New Zealand. So you have to leave New Zealand if you do anything other, you know, anything sort of different to that. Uh, if your stuff's not getting played on the radio, the chances of you making a living out of it is really really small. So, yeah, you sort of leave. And I don't know if that's anyone's fault. I just think that there's only four million people in this country, so... There's a few New Zealand bands that are doing really well overseas. Yeah. And some people might not even know them in New Zealand, but they're really big overseas. Yeah. Um, so when you see people, and because New Zealand's so small, you might know them. When you see people you know doing well, then you think, ah, oh, There's a possibility. I can do this. Yeah, yeah, it speaks of a possibility. Yeah, so that's exciting. Yeah. Okay, we're um, Jukes. Uh, we're from Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, my name's Matthew. I'm Ali Mitchell. Brad. <laughs> and we have a drummer and a bass player, but they're somewhere lost <laughs> over there. Uh, we play 
pop rock music, I suppose. Yeah. Is the radio right here? Dukes is a group from Christchurch. Their fame allows them to tour. However, their success doesn't extend beyond New Zealand's borders. Between rehearsals and concerts, I find an authenticity and an energy that enhances their music and reflects the general Kiwi state of mind. fun yeah it's good to play to different audiences New yeah. Zealand audiences are really difficult well, we think they're quite hard <laughs> you have to work hard to win them over yeah the audience is looking for different things and there's that possibility and potential for your music to work in a different way or to speak to someone in a different way so that's exciting and I think for New Zealand music you never know right now everyone's really excited about you know this acoustic reggae sort of style and um, but it, but it moves and things change and I think that you can contemplate the possibility of a career in music at, a, at, a, at 12 or 13 is, means that their advancement is that much faster and that much quicker. So I think that's exciting, just getting into it young and getting great advice young and understanding the industry young. I catch up with Flip Grader in Paris several months later while she's promoting her latest album and recording the next, a collaboration with local artists. It's the opportune time to see whether everything has gone as she had hoped. Was I far from where we started? I think partly I also I wanted to be in Paris because I always dreamed of living here at some point in my life. So. I'm happy that I have and I will continue to next year um, because despite or regardless of what I've achieved or will achieve here work-wise, it's just um, great to have achieved one of my life dreams which is to spend some time living in Paris. My plans were to promote the last album here when Vicious Circle released it and to re write and record um, my next album, my fourth album and I've done all of that now so I extended my trip by eight, um, by a couple of months, so I've been here eight months in total, and the audiences are really nice. In fact, some of my favourite shows ever have been here in the last eight months, like playing um, at Nouveau Casino to like a dead silent 200 people. Amazing. So I'm hoping that that French audiences like, um, in the same way that French friends just take a little time to warm up, but once they're there, they're really committed. So um, that's what I'm finding so far, and I think that audience is, is starting to grow, and I think it's, it's gonna be really good. I'm looking forward to that. 
um, to, to returning next year and playing more and more shows and building that. You have to admit, New Zealanders possess what we might clumsily call patriotism. But in reality, it's totally different. They have a link, a connection with their land that they feel even after going abroad. When I am overseas, I definitely miss this country. Um, I don't miss the music scene. It's definitely easier to find shows to play over there. But personally, you know, I. I miss the ocean, I miss the fresh air, I miss the greenery, you know, and it's a personal thing. It's like my music is pulling me elsewhere, but my person is wanting me home. Lots of young people really like traveling and they get a lot out of it. Most of them come back here and start careers and, and, and set up their life, but before they do, they a lot, a lot of a lot of people travel. A lot of Australians travel too. Um, I think it's because we're so far away from everything that people grow up with a natural curiosity as to what's out there. The desire is to perhaps live in New Zealand and be recognised as a New Zealand artist, but not have to shift and live somewhere else. Personally, I would love to be successful in, to, in the place I live in. I, I want to, you know, I want the people that are close to me to be able to you know, come and see me whenever they want and play. Everyone wants to be successful in their own hometown. It's, it's pride, isn't it? Well, that's the end of my voyage to Aotearoa. The artists that I met are proud to represent their country today. I think the main thing they're looking for is an audience, a wider audience. And even if going overseas might be seen as a solution, Without a doubt, their island is, and will remain, a unique destination on the artistic map. Where I fit into the scene, I'm, I'm still played uh, overseas on alternative and student radio, but there's the novelty factor that I'm from New Zealand. In New Zealand, it's not a novelty that I'm a Kiwi, but uh, in Germany, in France, then people are like, well, she's from New Zealand, and it's kind of an interesting point of difference. My New Zealand persona, personality, is going to influence mm. my accent, the way I say sentences, the way I think about the world. All of these things make us New Zealanders and make us Kiwi, and so definitely all of that stuff would affect my music, even if I'm trying to sound like someone from England or someone from America, if bands like ourselves insist on doing their own approach to the music and just mm -hmm. ignore the funding and ignore the clicky scenester BFM attitude of you don't sound exactly like us so you're crap, if more people ignore and ignore and just persevere then something has to give at, 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 at some point. We it might not be us but someone might listen to us and someone might listen to them and, and so on, and finally we can change. New Zealand music industry needs a stronger underground scene. I think there needs to be more venues and more pub owners willing to support local music at ground level. You need to be able, if you go to the UK for example, there are so many small pubs and caverns where you can go in there and, and see bands you've never ever heard of and they're out there sweating it out really, really hard. I think for New Zealand music to develop, you need to have that facility to allow young songwriters a chance to perform their music. Now, I think also long term, there's good and bad sides to that. The reason I love living in New Zealand is because no one knows about it and there's not many people here and it's, it's great. It's our own little paradise. So if suddenly this became the next LA or the next London and suddenly 100 million people come across here, then this would be a hellhole to live in. So um, yeah, so there's always good and bad with things. There's a perception 
that to be an, and I had this perception that to be an artist in New Zealand or anywhere in the world, that you were going to be poor. You would life, live a life of poverty. But what I discovered was that you um, have to be a business person and you have to really sell yourself, sell yourself and find new avenues. And a lot of artists here in New Zealand don't know this yet, but they will, they will find out. And there will also hopefully be more opportunities because there are so many New Zealanders who would love to be artists. The world is happening somewhere else. You know, are we good enough? We're so far away, are we relevant? And even to be asking those questions is an immature question. So that's a young country's question. You know, of course yeah. we're good enough, but we're, you know, we're here. This is us. Come in with a crack. 